Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time. Today we will be delving into the lore of one creature you absolutely do not want to encounter in the Underdark, or anywhere else for that matter, as long as you do actually possess some grey matter. The infamous Illithids, also known as the Mind Flayers, have been with Dungeons and Dragons for a very long time, inspired by the Chthonian Ancients, which feature in the novels of Brian Lumley and are directly inspired by the works of H.P. Lovecraft. I'll quote Lumley's original description of them here. Flowing tentacles and pulpy grey-black, elongated sack of a body. No distinguishing features at all other than the reaching, groping tentacles. Or was there? Yes, a lump in the upper body of the thing. A container of for sorts of a brain, basal ganglia, or whichever diseased organ govern this horror's loathsome life. In Dungeons and Dragons, I would certainly say that the author Bruce Cordell is the godfather of the Mind Flayers as we know them today. They are also feature heavily in the Spelljammer accessory setting for the game. With Mind Flayers being relatively common in the presence in the wider Prime Material universe, having an empire that spans the many crystal spheres. In my video detailing the Illithids, I talk about their temporal weirdness and that they seem to be a species that has recreated its itself and have an entirely engineered, predatory, coldly parasitic life cycle and biology existing in their own villainous ecosystem where other sentient life forms exist only to serve them as subjugated vassals, brain damaged slaves, host bodies, and a source of food. However, that is not the natural life cycle of the Illithid, and they are universally quite averse to discussing what happens if their carefully orchestrated society and artificial ecosystem catastrophically fails, and there is a reversion to their true, natural form. In the normal Illithid colony, the Elder Brain floats within a brine-filled pool surrounded by wriggling Illithid tadpoles that the hermaphrodite adults spawn periodically from the sticky egg clusters they lay on the edges of the pool enclosure situated in the heart of the colony lair. The elder brain feeds on these tadpoles as they also feed on each other. The dead larvae dissolve into the brine fluid to provide nutrients filtered and absorbed by all. The attendants and the elder brain itself never let any of the tadpoles reach more than a few inches in length before they are either killed or selected for bonding with a host body to become either mind flayers or other more exotic forms resulting from the seromorphosis transformation of creatures other than medium-sized humanoids. The Elder Brain will direct its Mind Flayer thralls to conduct all kinds of research and experimentation in this regard, constantly looking for hybrids to be combined with such as Beholders, Chul, Ropers, and so on. Among the strongest taboos in illicit society is the idea of allowing a mature tadpole to survive without implanting it into a donor brain. Such a creature, as it grows to a mature state by feeding on any intelligent creature it can catch, including illithids, is called a neothelid. Mind flayers consider them to be a dire threat and will hunt down and exterminate them as soon as they learn of their existence, except in very rare instances, which I will talk about in a few minutes. If the colony has been destroyed, the elder brain killed, and the infant illithid left to fend for themselves in the brine pool, they will cannibalize each other until only one remains and it will leave the brine pool soon after, driven by hunger. The first snack is liable to be any remaining brain golems created by the colony and not destroyed in whatever disaster befell the lair. It will then seek out any nearby intelligent life it can sense, and the neothelid has quite acute sensory powers. The Neothelid is aware of the presence of creatures within one mile of it that have an intelligence score of four or greater. It knows the distance and direction to each creature, as well as each creature's intelligence score, but can't sense anything else about it, nor does it care. A creature protected by a mind blank spell or a non-detection spell or similar magic can't be perceived in this manner. As a feral thing, a Neothelid knows nothing beyond the predatory existence it has lived so far and struggles to comprehend its new psychic abilities as it grows increasingly large and ravenously hungry for brain tissue. Neothelids prowl subterranean passages in search of more brains to sate their constant hunger, growing ever more vicious. While they do seem to eat creatures whole as they hunt, they don't digest the rest of the body, only the neural tissue. They manage to do this by use of a special fluid made of tissue dissolving enzymes secreted from their tentacle ducts. As they can actually spray this fluid out in a 60 foot cone, each creature caught in it must make a DC 18 dexterity saving throw, taking 10 D6 acid damage if they fail the save, half of that if they uh, manage to succeed. 
the horrific fluid reduces victims to a puddle of slime, leaving only the pulsing living brain tissue unharmed. Neolithids have no understanding of their length to a lithids, so they're just as likely to prey on them as anything else. As the Neolithid has an intelligence of only three, they can't detect each other's mental presence, and therefore several of them can be hunting the same area at once, in theory, though they are so rare that this is almost never the case. Almost never. There have been instances of the Elithids deliberately creating Neothalids as a biological weapon of last resort, such as when the Ulitharid Extremitin and its colony in the Sea Deeps deliberately bred a Neothalid with the purpose of unleashing it upon the Githyanki contingent in the Crystal Labyrinth of Undermountain sometime around 1492 DR. Actually, as this is a very recent event, I'll go into it in some finer detail. The Ulitharid named Extremitin and its Mind Flayer colony had plans to conquer Waterdeep. The group had fled its main colony on orders from its Elder Brain after a Githyanki attack on the main colony deep in the Underdark. Despite the relative security provided by the dungeon, the colony was under threat of extermination by the Githyanki group living in the Crystal Labyrinth of Undermountain. Making careful plans for invasion of such a heavily populated city, the Illitharid was extremely curious about the inhabitants of the surface world. In order to better understand them, it built a series of Psypods, devices that could imprison sentient creatures in a dream version of Waterdeep called Alterdeep, crafted from the information gathered telepathically from Waterdavian's minds. The Ulitharid then manifested itself within this psychic matrix-like illusion as any character it wished, although it showed a preference to appear as Durnan, the owner of the famous Yawning Portal Inn. At the same time, a Githyanki strike force commanded by the Knight Yavikla slowly opposed the Mind Flayers while awaiting reinforcements from the Crystal Labyrinth to conduct a final assault. In order to oppose the Githyanki, the Mind Flayers bred a Neothalid, which they planned to unleash upon them on both levels of the caverns. Additionally, a cloister of flumps inhabiting a tall cavern in the outskirts of the level fed on the Mind Flayers and Githyanki's psionic energy from a safe distance. The Githyanki slaughtered any flumps they encountered on site. Short of some sort of internal device that can be remotely activated to cause extreme pain to the Neothalid, there would be no way the Mind Flayers could have controlled the creature, even a little bit, other than to throw live bait and lead it in the direction of more food. As creatures of high intellect though, the Mind Flayers seem to be very tasty morsels to the Neothalids. Gargantuan, clumsily thrashing brutes, Neothalids have extraordinary strength and constitution, but well below average dexterity. They don't rely on sight in the Underdark at all, but they do have the ability to sense when they are in a lighted environment. Otherwise, their high wisdom score of 16 relates to how acute their other senses are, with a 120 foot blind sight and a passive perception of 13. They are fairly tough, with an armor class of 16 being very high for such a massive beast, thanks to a very tough and thick leathery hide studded with iron-hard, razor-sharp barbs and spikes that provide it with the means to travel with ease through the Underdark. It has a speed of 30 feet and a psychic ability to levitate as per the spell at will, which is something that often catches its prey by surprise when it ambushes them from lunging down from above, and it certainly helps them hunt down drow elves in the deep Underdark. Drow particularly hate the Neothalids because they are able to shrug off heavy doses of poisons with their high constitution and massive bulk, plus they are able to roll with advantage against spells and other magical effects, which puts the Drow on a bit of a back foot as magic is one of the main tactical advantages, as is their stealth, which is also fairly useless against a predator which is hunting down their actual thoughts. The Neothalids' other psychic powers they can use once per day are Confusion, Feeble Mind and Telekinesis, which all function exactly as the spells of the same name, with a spell save DC of 16. So, an armor class of 16 and an average of 325 hit points, in combat the Neothalid makes one attack against a single target within 15 feet, plus 13 to hit and doing 3d8 plus 8 bludgeoning damage, with slick mauve tentacles as strong as steel cable, plus with physical contact they also transfer 3d8 psychic damage. If the target is a large or smaller creature, it must succeed on a DC 18 strength saving throw or be swallowed by the Neothalid. A swallowed creature is blinded and restrained, has total cover against attacks and other effects outside of the Neothalid, but it takes 10d6 acid damage at the start of each of the Neothalid's turns as it's being dissolved. If the Neothalid takes 30 damage or more on a single turn from a creature inside it, the Neothalid must succeed on a DC 18 constitution saving throw, and bear in mind, it's 
got a pretty good uh, constitution saving score at the end of that turn or it regurgitates all swallowed creatures so I would have ruled that the combined damage of all of the swallowed creatures in a single round adding up to 30 points would be sufficient which will then be regurgitated and fall prone in a space 10 feet from the neothalid and of course they're sitting in a pool of this digestive acid so they need to actually get out of there and dose themselves with some water if the neothalid dies a swallowed creature is no longer restrained by it and it can escape from the corpse by using 20 feet of its movement exiting prone from its maw even though it is a challenge rating 13 creature a neothalid typically operates alone and is not a smart predator so if the player's characters keep their wits about them and have a bit of luck on their side, they can usually outmaneuver and whittle down the beast without much trouble if the terrain is wide open and in their favour. Neothalids don't have any allies coming to back them up, and the best they can hope for is to corner their prey or use their gargantuan size to topple the surroundings, smash up walls and floors and ceilings, and create a lot of difficult or impassable terrain. The creature can also use special moves related to its size and mass at the DM's discretion, such as slamming the ground, rolling over groups of opponents and making jackknifing tail slams as a dragon of that size would do. Much like a dragon as well, the Wicked Acid Breath Spray recharges at the start of the round on a roll of 5 or 6 on a 6-sided die, so the Neothalid will make full use of this as much as it possibly can. And if it does release two or more of such sprays in a few rounds in the same area, add pools of acid to the terrain as very dangerous tactical hazards that can also serve to isolate, divide and hamper the player character's party's movements. Elder brains can't detect Neothalids, they have to rely on the eyes and ears of their Mind Flayer minions to go out and hunt down these things, which is a huge risk and the Neothalid will be drawn to the massive mind stink of an Elder Brain as soon as it gets within range of its telepathic senses, which will be one of the few things that can actually seriously spook an Elder Brain and cause it to flee from the area as soon as possible, exposing the entire colony to a much greater risk just to save its own skin. They are pretty smart, the Elder Brains, but it's possible to actually pull this off as a ruse. They'd best not flee in the direction of the Underdark deep beneath Lurkwood though, as in the ruins of the Illithid city of Fanlink Cell, a fully mature Neolithid lurks. Well, that deserves some more detail as well. In 1339 DR, the Drow Ranger Drister Erden and his companions Belwar Disengulp and Clacker were captured and enthralled by Illithids and taken to serve as slaves in Fanlink Cell. They were released when the figurine of wondrous power named Guinevar attacked and killed the outer brain of the colony causing massive chaos and in the confusion many Illithids were killed by their own thralls as well as the escaping prisoners. The few surviving Illithids abandoned the city and fled to their kin in Gortlegrim and from the abandoned brain pool grew a Neolithid. Some years later the Illithid sept named Ilgacht founded by Methil L. Videnvelp God damn those names in uh, 1340 DR began using the ruined city as their base. The Sept's intention was to create a new Elder Brain and rebuild the city, but their progress was slow, particularly after Methyl was severely injured in 1358 DR. The Sept remained inactive for several decades until it was taken over by the Ulitharid Galgast Alvenkin, and by the time of the Spell Plague, the Sept were firmly entrenched in Fan Linksal and had tamed the Neolithid to serve as a gargantuan guardian. However, to the outside world, the settlement still appears to be abandoned. Personally, I love all the ideas that come from the weird parasite mutant idea of mind flayers, and the very thought of combining the tremendous size and power of a neolithid and a purple worm is awesome. For example, what if the characters exploring the Anrock Desert, or even better, the Plains of Purple Dust, encounter a neolithid purple sandworm that is the totem animal or demigod of some nomadic desert halflings whose eyes shine deep blue with a latent psychic power to mask their mental presence. D&D sandworm riding desert Fremen, anyone? Anything is possible in a game of limitless imagination. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride and as always, Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.